All right, good morning, everyone. Um, Brittany, do me a favor and get a roll sheet going around. Okay, if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, no, I just don't have my gray book with me. So uh, I, that's somewhere else. So. It means you all get hundreds. I think everybody's here. Is there any? Well, yeah, Eric's not here. Uh, Miss Norman isn't here. Okay, yeah, we can get a roll sheet. All right, well, everyone, I appreciate y'all showing up. Uh, Bram and I were a little bit concerned uh, because uh, it, did, it didn't appear that it was going to be uh, uh, a, a very popular day. Uh, but thank you all for coming. Thank you all for braving the elements. That's why you're honor students, right? That's, uh, that's very nice. Now, when we left off, we were talking about Napoleon. You know, we were talking about how uh, uh, he crowned himself emperor and began to reshape France for his, uh, in, in, his own, uh, uh, in his own way. Uh, France would essentially become an extension of his own personality. Well, let's look at that real quick. That's the Egypt invasion. I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, I didn't start up Nearpod. You're right. Yeah, let's do it. Y'all want to do Nearpod? Yes, of course we want to do Nearpod. <laughs> yeah. No, you need to see the other two first. Yeah, Mockingjay was really boring, wasn't it? Isn't that yeah. Okay, there it is, Nearpod. I'll put it on the board here. All right, all right. So speaking of building up emotions for excitement, uh, we've got an awful lot going on with this. So let's let's go here. Um, we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, as an administrator, Napoleon is going to uh, uh, just sort of reshape France to his liking. We know that obviously there's more to it. We we, we showed the pictures of, of him. We've of course already seen all of these pictures. Napoleon, uh, although not a particularly religious person. Uh, he did understand the role that the church plays, and so uh, he did support the church in the sense that he allowed the church to operate, and uh, he was, of course, officially a member of the church, but he did not give the church its property back. He did not give the church its property back, and everybody understood, uh, definitely the church, who was really in charge, you know, who was really in charge. Uh, he had divided France into logical administrative districts, uh, he also uh, implemented universal public education. You know, every French school child is going to go to school, and this is going to be a secular curriculum. That's the, uh, that's the key there. This is going to be an uh, enlightened-based education system. Yes. That I know of. This is the first universal public education that I know of. Yes. Now, again, it may have happened. You know, it may have been in some other nations, but uh, certainly it's the first big state. It's, cer it's certainly the first large state. What Napoleon was particularly proud of, what he was particularly proud of, and again, this is a uh, reflection of his desire to re, you know, rebuild Rome or, or create a Neo-Rome, is the Code Napoleon, the new French law code, the new French law code. And when you were looking at all those fancy pictures, you probably didn't notice that he is posing next to the Code Napoleon, a number of those uh, royal portraits that he did. You know, he's, he's posing next to it. Uh, we've even got one where his hand is extended over it. Yeah, France's new law code. Here's this one here, as you can see. 
uh, in this one, you know, his hand is extended over the code Napoleon. He wants everybody to understand uh, this is it, a new rational, logic-based law code uh, for the new France. Mm -mm. Nope, it is the code Napoleon. I'm sorry, what's that? Uh, there are elements of the Code Napoleon that are still in place, yes. Yeah, elements of it are. Uh, and the key to the Code Napoleon is it is logic-based. It is rationality-based. So he embraces equality under law, freedom of religion. Exactly. This is sort of like a constitution. Yes. The Code Napoleon abolishes serfdom. Uh, not officially. Not officially. What, the Louis? Uh, no, he abolished slavery in the colonies. Robespierre abolished slavery. He abolished slavery. In terms of the French economy, Napoleon, again, sought to be progressive. He sought to uh, be logical and rational. He created a central bank to regulate the French currency. He created a central bank to regulate the currency. Uh, counterfeiting was a big deal uh, back in this era, not just in France, but everywhere. Uh, anytime paper money was used to represent uh, to represent gold or silver, yes, counterfeiting was uh, counterfeiting was definitely there. And uh, a lot of my studies, like in the United States, uh, you find a lot of issues re regarding counterfeiting. Yes, he created a, 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 a French national bank, a central bank. He also put a lot of money into infrastructure. Whoa, where'd that go? Is that all about? There we go. Yeah, apparently. So. Oh, 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 right. I, I had to reset my settings, so. Um, he created a French, uh, excuse me, he put a lot of money into infrastructure. He put a lot of money into infrastructure. Roads, bridges, canals, ports, exactly. Okay, somebody tell me where I, uh, general, auto lock, there we go. Auto lock, never. Okay. He put a lot of money into roads and infrastructure. Ah. Not this again. Yeah, yeah, I probably ought to. Hmm? Well, because that's pointing at me right here. I'm sorry? I'm recording. I'm recording it. That's a, yeah, that's a video. All right, we've got a new ID. I know, it's awful. W G H Y F. Boy, today is a today we are experiencing all kinds of technical fun. We'll get going. Why? I'm telling you, we're going to have to take this out in the edit. You interrupt the class all the time, but that's all right. I like interrupting the class. Y'all can go through and see what I go through up here, right? Uh, well, I mean, this is, I guess, anybody that wants to watch it. It's going to be on YouTube, but this is 
really for you more than anyone else. <laughs> Expanding the minds, that's right, that's right. You never know who might decide to uh, watch a history lecture from MGCCC, you never know. Um, now, think about this for a minute. He creates a national bank. Who are the kind of people that like the idea of a centralized currency and a modern banking system? What kind of people would say, yeah, that's middle classes, exactly. Uh, he also encourages uh, promotion and success based on talent rather than uh, based on who you know or heredity or things of that nature. Again, middle class like that. You know, if you want a job in the government, it's not about being a nobleman or who you know. Uh, you're going to have to prove your talent. Who likes the roads and the bridges and the infrastructure like that? Merchants do, right? Middle class does. Also, the army. The army loves this, exactly. And, of course, workers. Right, so, you know, the, the poor, the laborers, as we said, the ditch diggers need ditches to dig. And so the urban poor like this too. This is all happy. He even regulated bread prices, which of course proves that he was certainly a pragmatic man. Someone's going to do it. Well, Robespierre did too, but he was smart enough to know regulate bread prices, kind of important. And so the question of whether or not he preserved the revolution or he undermined the revolution well, uh, you know, clearly he's undermining the revolution by restoring sort of this absolute system, even though he would have claimed that he wasn't. Everybody knows that he was. But at the same time, he's preserving the revolution by, uh, by implementing a lot of these reforms that the middle class wanted and by standing by them. So you, you can go either way. Like I said, later I'll, I'll give you my opinion uh, when we get to the end of Napoleon. But it, 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 is, a, uh, it is a controversial topic. Now, as much as we... Uh, as much as we can study Napoleon as an administrator and as a, as a political leader. Obviously, Napoleon is best known as a field general, right? He's best known uh, for, his, for his military exploits. And remember, Napoleon's logic is I am rebuilding Rome. I am spreading the revolution and these, these new ideas everywhere where they do not exist. And so that would be his logic for this attempt to sort of conquer Europe and move out. Uh, probably not. Probably not. He would have probably called it something, yeah, something Napoleon, exactly, something Napoleon. Now, what we need to understand, and I mentioned this before, I mentioned this before, but it is absolutely the truth. Napoleon was a brilliant military commander. By the time he became emperor, he was already very experienced. You know, he had been involved in a lot of uh, military campaigns before he ever even became emperor. And his ability to understand how to win a battle was simply unparalleled. It was simply unparalleled. Napoleon. His ability to, to command an army and understand a battlefield. Oh, yes, he's never, he never gets the Navy right. He never gets the Navy right. But on the, on the battlefield, you do not want to go against him. It is just that simple. And I'm not going to get into the details behind his tactics, but just, just understand that. Of course, he would make sure that the French army was the best trained, the best equipped. You know, man for man, he would ensure that these were the best soldiers in Europe. He uses patriotism. You know, this idea that we are fighting for the glory of France, we are fighting for the revolution. You know, he uses those tools to motivate his soldiers, and it works. They love him. You know, he is being compared to Caesar. He is being compared to Alexander the Great. And, of course, the one very important comparison is those soldiers would you know, fight anywhere. You know, his soldiers were incredibly loyal. And the fact that he won was a big reason. You know, again, it, that's, that's what you want to do if you're a general. Now, without getting into, again, the details, after him becoming emperor, there was already a coalition of European states out to stop him. There was already a coalition of European states out to stop him. Yeah, after he becomes emperor. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Go ahead. Coalition. Coalition. Now, we already know what the British think of him, right? You know, he had attempted to uh, take Egypt. Well, yeah, but for the most part. Now, we already know what the British think. 
But naturally, the Austrians, the Prussians, they don't like him either. You know, he's saying, I am going to spread the revolution. Well, naturally, not good. Not good if you are the leaders of these Eastern European states. By the time of him becoming emperor, France already occupies parts of Italy. You know, by the time he becomes emperor. Can he make the trick? <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. In 1805, in 1805, Napoleon defeated a Russian-Austrian army at the Battle of Austerlitz. Napoleon defeated a Russian-Austrian army at the Battle of Austerlitz. Yeah, this was in 1805. Now, Napoleon was outnumbered at this battle. But he didn't just win. He absolutely crushed the Austrian-Russian army. You know, when this was over, there really wasn't an army left to oppose him. You know, this battle just completely destroyed this army. Well, that's, that's Austerlitz. Well, that's not why Austerlitz is called that, but it was it was in Austria. It was in Austria. The battle was actually that battle actually took place in Austria. And so Austria was, of course, humiliated. Yes. Uh, among other things, among other things, actually, what he did was divide and conquer. You know, he went around him and divided him. After Austerlitz, he defeated the Russians in a series of battles. You know, after the Austrians were completely knocked out, he then went after the Russians and defeated the Russians more than once. Yes. In Eastern Europe, not in Russia. He hadn't invaded Russia yet. In 1807, in 1807, Napoleon defeated the Prussians. Napoleon defeated the Prussians. Yes, now this is Prussia with a P. And again, this was, this was actually a pretty, pretty nasty campaign. There's a number of battles that, were, that went along with this. The Prussians put up a really, really big fight. But again, Napoleon was just better. You know, his army was better, and he outsmarted him, and he beat him. It's that simple. No, 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 Prussia. This is Prussia. This is North Germany. And the Prussians. Yes, this is all in Eastern Europe. Now, the, the, the Russians actually supported the Prussians during this campaign. You know, the Tsar supports the Austrians, then he turns around and he supports the Prussians. In both cases, it is, you know, it's over. I mean, Napoleon's army just wins. They whip them, whip them bad. And so after Prussia was defeated, Napoleon set out to simply redraw Europe. You know, his goal was not just to, uh, was not just to defeat these armies, but he simply redrew Europe to his own, uh, you know, to his own liking. You're not texting, are you? Okay, all right, just making sure. And this is the map that he came up with. This is the map that he came up with. And y'all, again, y'all can see it on your, uh, y'all can see it on your, on your devices. We have France, which is a heck of a lot bigger than, uh, than the France that Napoleon inherited. You know, France extends into Italy. France includes Belgium, the Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera. He dissolves the Holy Roman Empire. But I want you to take a closer look at Prussia and Austria. 
You know, he can't just simply dissolve those states outright. But he has taken steps to severely weaken them, to severely limit them. What has he done to Austria that would make Austria a weaker state? Took away its ports, exactly. If you'll notice, Austria no longer has access to the Mediterranean. Austria no longer has access to the Mediterranean. Yeah. Now, when you look at Prussia, Prussia is obviously still on the Baltic, but Prussia is hemmed in by Denmark and Sweden. So if you can control where you know the, the, the waterways around Denmark and Sweden, you have now locked Prussia out of the Atlantic. And so you have severely limited Prussia and Austria's access to the sea. You have severely limited Prussia and Austria's access to the sea. Well, and to a certain extent, but he, you know, he, he understands that this is a source of strength for these states, and so he's controlling that. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, Russia's supporting him. Right, now I'm not, well, look at Russia. Russia can't get out either. If you control Denmark and Sweden's, Yeah, yeah, you can get out of Archangel about two months a year if you're in Russia, but that's about it. You're, you know, what he's doing is he's controlling naval access. He's controlling naval access. Now, I'm not getting into the very complex diplomacy because this is never as simple as, as, as it would sound. There's a lot of complexities here. But after this time, Napoleon actually reached out to the Tsar, and he reached out and, and, and you know, agreed to form an alliance. And what he basically said was, if you and me team up together, we can take the Ottoman Empire, we can take India, you know, the world cannot stop a combined Russian-French force at this point. That if you put your enormous resources behind my leadership and, and, and my officer corps, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll rule the world. And believe it or not, the Tsar, uh, you know, Alexander actually considered this. You know, briefly he, he considered an alliance with Napoleon, uh, but after some careful consideration he concluded, no, this is not the case, and he took an entirely different, uh, entirely different approach. In 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain. Control. Napoleon invaded Spain. 1808. You know, he is at the height of his power right now. He made his brother Joseph the king. He made his brother Joseph the king of Spain, yeah. And he also started creating noble titles for other relatives. You know, other, Italian, uh, uh, other relatives got Italian noble titles and things like that. So he started creating a new group of nobility based around his family and, to some extent, his friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, he had, yes, yes, absolutely. His father was actually uh, the Corsican representative at Louis XVI's court. Yeah, he has, he, so, yes, yeah, and then he had, a, he, you know, his family. And Napoleon is also kind of smart about this. You know, Napoleon is wanting to create an empire, and he is sort of creating this new, uh, this new royal line of Bonapartes, even though they had been noble before. But he wants his family to start marrying into the old nobility. Because what happens once you get married and have kids? You're tied. You know, you're, you're linked for life. And so Napoleon actually wanted, and, and uh, another problem he had is that his wife Josephine couldn't have children. He couldn't have children with her, and so he had to divorce her, uh, and he would eventually uh, have another wife. But he wanted to marry the Tsar's daughter at one point, you know, he, he, to, to, to form that alliance, but the Tsar, uh, the Tsar wouldn't go along with it. And supposedly that offended Napoleon. He got very angry about that. But what he's doing is he's trying to integrate his family into the noble lines of Europe, and you do that through marriage, because once you're married and have kids, you, know, you, can't, you can't walk away from it. You can't walk away from it. So he's, he's being very shrewd about this. Yeah, and, and now he's exactly. So you know, did he preserve the revolution or did he undermine it? Exactly. You, you know, that's the big debate. Everywhere, of course, Napoleon conquers, the code Napoleon is put in place. Everywhere that he conquers, the code Napoleon is put in place. The Code Napoleon. And there are a lot of people that, that welcome him. You know, there's a lot of people in Europe that see him as a liberator. A lot of middle classes embrace what he's doing. A number of German states formed alliances with him. 
You know, he made a lot of friends. A lot of states are forced into alliances with him. They don't necessarily like him, but they're smart enough to know which way the wind is blowing. But now, of course, we have to start the fall of Napoleon. Because after 1808, he starts making a series of decisions that ultimately leads to his collapse. So as we know, Napoleon did fall, so let's take a look at what, let's take a look at what brought him down. And again, this map tells you, this map tells you a lot of what brought Napoleon down. There are two great powers that Napoleon still does not control. What are they? Russia and Britain. Those are the two great powers that he does not control. And these are two great powers that are not going to cooperate with him. They are going to oppose him and defy him and do everything they can to undermine him. They do not support him at all. Like I said, although the Tsar did flirt with a, an alliance, uh, it did not take him long before he concluded, absolutely not, I will not support Napoleon at all. So let's look at some of the steps that led to his downfall. One is the continental system. Oh, there's Alexander I, of course. One is the continental system. Where is it? There we go. One is the continental system. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a trade, uh, it's a trade code. In order to weaken Britain, Napoleon issued a blockade of Europe against British goods across the entire continent. Yeah, this is the continental system. That's the, that's the, that's the line. You know, those are the ports that are blocked. Effectively making every port off limits to British trade. And this was an attempt to weaken the British. Nobody can trade with Britain, exactly, in an attempt to weaken Britain and crush Britain. Now, when you start thinking about the logistics of this, it is not going to work. There's a number of reasons why this is a really bad idea. Number one, how on earth are you going to enforce a blockade of every port in Europe? It's just not realistic. It cannot be done. It cannot be done. And to make it even more unrealistic, in 1804, excuse me, 1805, the French Navy had been obliterated at the Battle of Trafalgar. The French Navy. The French Navy had been obliterated at the Battle of Trafalgar. <laughs> this battle took place off the southern coast of Spain, and it was an absolute disaster for the French. This was against the British, yes. It is considered one of the greatest naval victories in British history. It's put right up there with uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada. General Horatio, or Admiral Horatio Nelson was the great hero of Trafalgar. He was killed during the battle, but what it did was it put the French Navy back years. It put the French Navy back years. Like I said, Napoleon does not understand naval affairs very well. You know, issuing a blockade of all of Europe without the ships to do it is not realistic. But on another level, yes? You mean, had the Continental System been enforceable? Probably not, even if the French Navy hadn't been lost at Trafalgar. Because remember, the British Navy is more powerful. You know, the British Navy is, is going to do whatever it wants to do. There is no state that can oppose the British Navy at this time. So uh, it, it just, it, it was unrealistic. Not to mention the fact that the British are going to find all kinds of ways to get around this blockade. 
You know, they don't have to use military strength to get around a, a uh, naval embargo. You know, they can they can come up with all kinds of sneaky ways to get goods into Europe. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that's exactly what I was about to get to. Uh, who are the people on, in Europe that do not like the idea of a of an embargo against the British? The middle classes, exactly. The very people Napoleon claims to be helping are being hurt with this idea. So it makes him uh, kind of unpopular among the very people that he is claiming to be a, uh, a representative of. So the continental system was just a bad idea. It did not weaken Britain in any substantial way, but it did make him less popular. And to a large extent, it hurt the economy of Europe far more than it hurt the economy of Britain. And I guess I didn't zoom in on this. This is a great character. Well, the middle class don't like this. This is a great caricature uh, from this era. We have the French and the English. Of course, the French have carved up uh, have carved up Europe for themselves, and of course, the English have carved up the rest of the world. The, the English have carved up the rest of the world, and uh, uh, the caption is uh, "The plum pudding is in danger." Uh, you, you know. Uh, not enough for all of us is basically the idea. Yeah, the, the, the rest of the world, there's nothing left for the rest of the world. The British get the globe, and the French get Europe, and there you go. I love this. Uh, I love this cartoon. I love this cartoon. A second, a second cause that weakened Napoleon was Spain. His decision to invade Spain and put his brother on the throne was very short-sighted. It was very short-sighted. The Spanish people did not support this. The Spanish people did not support this. Yeah. Bad idea. Uh, the Habsburgs are still in Austria. Now, the Habsburgs are no longer in Spain, of course, uh, but they are, they are the rulers of Austria. Yes, the Habsburgs are the Austrian, you know, the Austrian emperor is a Habsburg. Well, they're weakened during Napoleon's era, but when Napoleon falls and after it's over, they're going to emerge very powerful. You know, the Habsburgs will come back much stronger as a result of Napoleon's downfall, because they gain, you know, they gain because they had opposed it. Now, remember, Spain is 98% peasant. There is no large middle class. You know, Spain is, a, is, is largely a third-rate power. Napoleon really didn't have to have much to do with it. It was more ego than anything else that uh, uh, prompted him to invade it. But what happened is the Spanish people uh, started fighting back using guerrilla tactics. As a matter of fact, this is where the term comes from. It is guerrilla, not gorilla like a big monkey. It is guerrilla. This is the Spanish. The Spanish people uh, are using these tactics. If, if, if uh, people use guerrilla tactics to fight an invading army, what are they really doing? What, what does that mean? Hit and run kind of stuff. Yeah, they don't wear uniforms. They don't fight traditional battles. You know, they just sort of jump out from behind trees and shoot you and run off. They harass you rather than try to defeat you one on one. And so, in order to try to counter this, Napoleon had to send more and more soldiers and more and more resources to try to suppress this resistance among the Spanish people. And and the more he did that, the more they hated him. The more he did that, the more that more uh, that he hated him. Yes, to, to revolt against the French. Now, of course, what was really frustrating to Napoleon is that these Spanish guerrillas have plenty of money. You know, they keep, you know, they're well funded, right? They keep, you know, they keep getting weapons. They seem to have lots and lots and lots of guns and lots of uh, uh, tools of war. And, of course, made in where is stamped on every one of these. Made in England, exactly, exactly. The English just are just happy to su supply these Spanish guerrillas with everything they can to try and harass the French troops. And so this would become not just a, a big problem in Spain and a big thorn for Napoleon, but this is unpopular among the French people because the French people understand that this is stupid. Why are we doing this? Why are we uh, trying to uh, uh, maintain control over a nation that, that we have no business being in? Nothing in Spain that they particularly wanted, exactly. Nothing that, that was really mission critical for Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> I would think that behind the scenes they probably were. I've never researched that. That's actually a, a topic that would be well worth researching if, if it's never been uh, looked into. But finally, of course, Napoleon's downfall came from his own, uh, just his own military blunder. A very, very big one. I'm sorry? He invaded Russia. Exactly. Let's get back to this one. Let's get back to this one. Yeah, this is number three.
Well, we'll get into that. By 1811, the Tsar, of course it is Alexander I, the Tsar has come to conclude that if anybody is going to defeat Napoleon, it's going to have to be him. You know, he came to conclude that, that, that Europe must be saved and he is the one to save it. You know, I am the only one left with the kind of power to defeat Napoleon. You know, it's just that simple. As a matter of fact, he began to argue that God put him on this earth to defeat Napoleon. You know, it is my mission from God to, to, to defeat this man, and so obviously God is going to put me in charge of Europe's largest state in order to give me the tools to do it. Oh, uh, George, you know, King George, uh, George the uh, Third dies, I believe, in 1810. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, but remember, Britain is now more of a parliamentary system than anything else. The king doesn't have a whole lot of power now. The king doesn't have a whole lot of power. Yeah, Lord Castlereagh is, is the prime minister, if I'm not mistaken, but that's, that's not important. I'm sure the church probably, well, the, the, uh, the Tsar's not Catholic, so there's not a whole lot the church is going to do about it anyway. Yeah, the Patriarch of Moscow is saying go for it, exactly. Um, so the Tsar, of course, agrees with the British to oppose everything they can that Napoleon does. And let's be honest, the Tsar is also smart enough to know that if I use my immense power to defeat Napoleon, I can come out ahead. You know, if I am the only big army standing, when this is all over with, it puts me in a position of tremendous advantage. In June of 1812, Napoleon decided to take care of the Tsar once and for all. In June of 1812, he decided to take care of the Tsar once and for all. And of course, if you're going to invade Russia, you're going to need a big army. He raised 600,000 men, Napoleon, the largest army ever assembled to date, 600,000. He won Austerlitz with 73,000. Now, that was probably the biggest army that he had ever commanded. And now he's raising an army of 600,000, many times bigger. And, of course, all of these men are battle-tested. These are all veterans. These are all veterans of previous campaigns, the very best equipment, the very best of everything. There is no way the Tsar can hope to defeat this grand army. Can the Tsar get together 600,000 men? Of course but they're going to be armed with sticks and stones. You know, the Russian army, the real professional Russian army, is much, much smaller. And so, yes, the Tsar can, can assemble a massive army of peasants, but they don't stand a chance against Napoleon's grand army. Oh, there's plenty more peasants. The, Tsar, the Tsars have always known that. Russian leaders have always known we can always send more peasants. Yes, that is, that is <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Napoleon, of course, concludes that Russia will likely surrender without a fight. You know, that the minute I move my grand army into Russia, the Tsar will immediately seek negotiations. He has no chance. He has no chance. And these aren't just French soldiers. A lot of these are other Eastern European soldiers that are now forced into uh, alliances with him. And on that, let's figure out what happens on our return. So a week from Monday, we'll finish this up and we'll have the exam on Wednesday, okay? Sound good? And if this worked, I will post this on YouTube and I will put a link on the website to the uh, YouTube channel, okay? I'm still kind of getting it all together, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to start doing this, so I'll post the link. Y'all take care. Have a good day.